A very good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for clicking on to the Tropical Outlook for Saturday, the 8th of June. Hope everybody is safe and well wherever you are. Yeah, shaking things up a little bit. They're going to make a bit of a Saturday tropical feature. Not necessarily going to be every week, but uh, nonetheless, I thought it would probably be an appropriate time. Uh, in years going by, I uh, looked at the tropics in quite a bit of detail, followed significant hurricane hits on Central America, North America, etc., etc., Kind of drifted away over the last few years, but uh, with it being an expected very, very active season this year, potentially near record breaking, in fact, I thought it would be a good time to get back into the tropics and let's just follow this hurricane season through. And uh, so, yeah, um, let me know in the comments section below if you're enjoying the tropical outlooks and uh, trying to understand a little bit more about tropical meteorology looking at the global picture as well as just the European outlook, which is obviously Monday to Friday, based uh, primarily on the UK, uh, uh, Ireland, and obviously Europe as well. But uh, during the course of the weekend, we tend to veer away a little bit from Europe and look at the big picture. Obviously, the live stream is back tomorrow at 4 p.m. We're going to look at the cold spell that we've got at the moment over the UK and Ireland. Is there going to be a potential break in this pattern to something a little bit more June-like, uh, because we do have temperatures uh, this afternoon of only 6 Celsius at both Loch Skarnock and Alt Nahar at the moment. Very, very cold for the time of the year. We'll look at that um, in a little bit of detail tomorrow in the live stream, so I hope you can join me. Massive thank you, by the way. The video yesterday, last night, actually had over 3,000 views and i've noticed there's been quite a significant uptick in subscribers as well so a massive thank you to everybody if you're new to the channel welcome and i hope you're enjoying the content here on the channel also if you happen to be an existing subscriber and you're sticking around i know a lot of people are more interested in winter weather but a massive thank you for your ongoing support to the channel because uh, if it wasn't for yourselves i simply wouldn't be doing this so you're making it worth my while, you're driving my uh, enthusiasm to deliver more content here in the channel. So a massive thank you to everybody. So let's get into it. This is the current CDAS uh, data for sea surface temperatures based on the, the 1981 to 2010 climatology. And you can see that we have the continued warm Atlantic and you've got the ongoing signature of the La Nina. Let's look and see the latest on La Nina. You can see that Nino region 1.2 continues to cool off to around a degree below the uh, average here. So that is well within La Nina territory. But we have to look actually at Nino region 3.4 to get a better handle. Because this is actually the, the region that NOAA and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology look at in terms of classifying uh, either El Nino or La Nina. To classify it for El Nino, it has to be over a half a degree above average. For La Nina, it has to be a half a degree below average. And you notice here that we have been cooling back below uh, the average, but recent times we've actually seen a slight rise in temperature to above uh, average here, which is rather interesting. I also noticed here, if we look at the SOI, which is a measure of air pressure between Darwin and Australia and Tahiti in the South Pacific. When you've got values that are negative, it tends to mean that the atmosphere is more El Nino. And if you've got them positive, you tend to find the atmosphere is reflective of La Nina. And you notice here that we've had quite a significant drop off in the daily, daily SOI contribution. I've actually had minus 26.92, 26. 26 Point six four minus eighteen ninety eight, and the, this is the important aspect: the thirty and the ninety day average is what you look at in terms of a better overall picture of the atmospheric state. You notice here that it's actually negative at the moment. Here we've seen back during late May, early June, uh, positive values, and you want to see these into the teens and twenties below, uh, or sorry, above to see the atmosphere responding to those cold waters. But you notice here that there's been a little bit of a slowdown in the progress of La Nina. And you can see that quite clearly in the 30 
and the 90 day SOI average here. So that was quite interesting to see both in terms of the temperature anomaly of both mean your region 1.2 and 3.4, but also the SOI, like I say, which is the, the, the measuring the atmospheric state. So the La Nina has kind of slowed down its progress in recent times, and uh, we'll continue to monitor this as we go forward. Strong El Nino, uh, La Nina, should I say, strong La Nina, and a very, very warm Atlantic tends to favor more tropical cyclone activity within the Atlantic. But obviously, we have got um, an early part of the season. Sea surface temperatures typically in the central and eastern Atlantic tend to be a little bit on the cool side at this time of the year. It's once you progress through July into August, into September, that's when the uh, the sea surface temperature becomes a lot more uniform. That crucial 27 Celsius or above threshold to support and to enhance tropical cyclones tends to be more present all the way across the Atlantic Basin towards Africa. That being said, it is a different story this time around because we actually have sea surface temperatures that more reflect late July as opposed to uh, as opposed to mid June, and this is the current sea surface temperatures over the tropical Atlantic here. So, like I say, the threshold is generally twenty seven or eighty degrees Fahrenheit to support tropical activity. Now, you notice here around the Cape Verde Islands. We've got water temperatures between the Cape Verde and the African coast. The, uh, these waters are, rel are rather cool at this time of year. And that is typical. That is something you normally would see. And development at, during the month of June, you typically have about one storm per June on average. Um, and also it tends to be more within the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, um, that general vicinity of the Atlantic Basin you don't usually see a lot of activity within the open tropical Atlantic. But you can see here that we do actually have um, some robust uh, convection here extending from the East Pacific all the way to the Western Atlantic. You've got this envelope of moisture here at the moment. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a second. We've got some African waves uh, that are ex uh, extending off the coast over the tropical Atlantic and progressing uh, east to west, which is usual. They're riding the easterly uh, trade winds here. We've got an area of very strong high pressure over the middle Atlantic. That is essentially the wheel that is steering this convection underneath uh, across the tropical Atlantic. Now, at this time of the year, you also notice that the convection, the intertropical convergence zone, or ITCZ, which is the conversion of winds, that allows storms to blow up is quite far south at this moment in time. That is, again, typical. Your Cape Verde Island chain is up here off the coast of Africa. You're talking about maybe seven, 800 miles to the north of this area of convection at the moment. As the season progresses and these water temperatures, that 27 Celsius isotherm, continues to extend its way towards the African coast, you're then going to see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge continue to migrate to its northernmost summer position, then this convection will rise northwards here. So it's going to lift north and eventually wind up around the Cape Verde Islands. That typically uh, happens late July, early August. And then that's when you start to get in to the meat of the hurricane season. But like I say, typically at the moment here, very, very warm waters within the Caribbean, well above average for the time of the year over the Caribbean, over the Gulf of Mexico, if the atmosphere is conducive and the MGO is also conducive, we'll look at that as well, that's when you typically see systems developing here. So back to the current sea surface temperature anomalies here, this uh, was the Atlantic. Let's have a look and see what it's showing in terms of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico here. So uh, just bear with me a little second here just to get uh, to the right chart. It always does help, um, and we'll see Western Atlantic Basin. So here we go. So these are the current sea surface temperatures within the Caribbean. Notice here that we've got a widespread um, 29 to 30 Celsius here. So very, very conducive water temperatures here. But it's not just the surface temperatures. 
it's deep below the ocean heat content which is actually a chart i've not got but i will try and show you in the saturdays to come because that's quite important it's it's all very well having sea surface temperatures of 27 celsius at the surface but these systems can upwell deep waters colder waters and that has a negative impact once these systems get into the caribbean you tend to find that the ocean heat content is much greater that what i mean by that is at the surface you might have 30 celsius but that warm very very warm water extends down about 100 to 150 meters below the surface that means that you've got an almost unending fuel for these systems to drive off and that is the, the the big concern at this time of the year especially when you've got water temperatures that are like kind of mid to late july level any kind of system that that tries to develop and we've got prospects of that in the, in the coming week or so you, there's a lot of fuel here for these systems then to feed off you've also got 27 28 29 celsius waters now extending into the gulf of mexico you've actually got a ribbon of 30 celsius now showing up you've got a loop current here you've got a, a very warm water current that runs through the caribbean between the yucatan and uh, western cuba into the gulf of mexico it loops around the gulf through the florida straits to the south of uh, of key west and the florida keys past uh, the bahamas and then up the eastern uh, seaboard of the united states as the the gulf stream that essentially is the gulf stream but you've got this loop current that runs through the caribbean around the gulf of mexico between florida and cuba and up the eastern side of the united states and that is the loop current and that is the uh, basically the origins of the gulf stream this is a region that is very very um dangerous in terms of tropical cyclone uh, activity so you can see here um we've talked about the the la nina let's ha move on here and look at the current areas of convection we've got a big area of thunderstorms moving uh, from northwest to southeast over the united states continue to see a lot of troughs dropping into the eastern half of the united states and we need to watch this by the way we've got this big uh, area of a uh, high pressure anomalous high pressure that has been persistent for weeks and months on end supporting drought conditions over much of mexico and belize the good news is however that we are starting to see convection now lifting a little bit further north into the yucatan into belize in the areas that have been starved of moisture for weeks on end now but it's this area right here between eastern pacific through the caribbean into the western atlantic basin that we need to watch out for over the next week to 10 days here you can see the ongoing uh, monsoon trough over northern central america so we're continuing to see heavy showers and thunderstorms over cuba uh, colombia sorry venezuela and uh, that will continue over the next little while but if we look at the Madden Julian oscillation. So we've got areas of sinking and we've got areas of rising. Now, in recent weeks, we've seen a lot of enhanced convection over the Indian Ocean, over the maritime continent, and now we're starting to see that eastward progress of enhanced convection. We're starting to see widespread sinking over the Indian Ocean, over the maritime continent, and that MJO or Madden Julian oscillation pulse is now entering the central and east pacific so up until now we've had a lot of sinking over the americas over the atlantic basin not conducive for tropical cyclone activity but notice here that as we play through the loop you know, the greens represent rising air the browns and oranges represent sinking air now as we progress towards the middle portion of this month you notice that we're starting to see green showing up now over the caribbean over the atlantic basin there's the widespread sinking over the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. That is showing that the MJO now moving into phases 7, 8, 1, possibly into 2. As we start to see these greens now moving over the Atlantic Basin, that means that the atmosphere is a little bit more conducive for uh, enhanced convection. So this is going to help out, even take away any tropical development, this is going to help the places out that have seen major drought central america and possibly into the heart of mexico 
um, we may start to see moisture, much needed moisture, moving up into Mexico and even the uh, the Caribbean. We're also going to be seeing a lot of moisture starting to move into Florida. Uh, we've had a, a kind of building drought over South and Central Florida in recent weeks. This is going to be welcome news as well because you're going to start to see that the uh, area of anomalous high pressure over Mexico, over the Caribbean, that's been producing ongoing record heat drought conditions. We're starting to see a pattern change as this MJO enters the uh, the Americas, the Atlantic, and this will start to allow increased moisture across a broader area of this region of the world. So if you notice here that we've had um, an anomalous area of high pressure over Mexico, over the Central uh, Central America for weeks on end, what we are going to start to see is um, troughs start to drop out of between Western Canada and the southeastern United States. And we're, are, we're seeing this envelope of moisture over Central America, over this southern and eastern Caribbean. Uh, we've had quite the split, actually, over this region. Heavy flood and rainfall over eastern Caribbean, drought conditions over the western Caribbean. As the MGO then enters this region, we're going to start to see the moisture become a little bit more expansive and the possibility of something trying to develop, maybe even an area of low pressure, not necessarily a full-fledged um, hurricane or a tropical storm, because we still have a lot of wind shear blowing out of the Pacific through the Caribbean into the Western Atlantic Basin. Uh, so the atmosphere is not overly conducive for development, but you notice here that if we play through this uh, GFS 500 millibar geopotential height and normalized anomaly, you start to see these heights coming down over this region here. When you've got these strong areas of high pressure over this region, we're suppressing rainfall. That means it's very difficult to see showers and thunderstorms develop. But as we play through this loop, you notice here that we're starting to see these troughs drop out of Canada into the southeastern United States. And what it's going to do is it's essentially allowing a lot of moisture over the Caribbean, over the Central America region, to start lifting northwards here. And actually these troughs that drop southeast act as a bit of a magnet. It pulls that moisture out of the tropics northwards here. So as we play through, you can see this kind of line of troughs continuing to drop south. There's the height starting lower over the eastern Gulf of Mexico, if you notice. And as that ridge of high pressure then kind of lifts north into the western United States, you're actually allowing heights to drop over Mexico. That may allow the moisture to then get drawn northwards here over more of the Mexican mainland here. So you notice here a little bit of a congregation of low heights over the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So that may be sniffing out some sort of development here of an, an area of low pressure, not necessarily like, a, say, a fully-fledged tropical storm or hurricane, but nonetheless, it shows uh, moisture building. So let's have a look and see at the, the, the moisture levels within the, uh, within the Gulf of Mexico here. Let me have a quick look and see if I can get a better view here of this region of the um, of the Western Atlantic Basin. So here we go. Um, this is the, um, let's get back here to it. So this is uh, tomorrow. And you can see here the thunderstorm is developing here over um, Central America, Honduras, Nicaragua, Belize. We're seeing um, scattered showers and thunderstorms. We've got an area of, of quite enhanced showers and thunderstorms over Cuba. As we play through this loop, bear in mind what's happening. We've got these troughs dropping into the eastern United States here. We're getting this high over Mexico to start getting pulled up towards the western United States here. And as it does so, it opens a bit more of a door to some of this moisture that's been suppressed to the south and the east to start lifting north and northwestwards here. And you're starting to see actually um, a kind of buildup of moisture over the uh, the region, western Cuba, Yucatan, and possibly into the Gulf of Mexico here. So you notice here that we've got uh, quite a uh, convex, convecting area 
uh, over the Central America here, over the Western Caribbean. And we're starting to see as the heights coming down that the GFS is sniffing out some sort of a low development here over the northeastern Gulf. That is going to drive a lot of tropical moisture into Florida. And we're going to see significant rainfall through Cuba, the Keys, into Florida as we progress through the course of this week here. Now, whether anything develops proper or not remains to be seen. We've still got a lot of shear in the environment. That is um, a change of wind direction and strength with height. When you've got strong wind shear, it tends to suppress development here at least. Um, but it doesn't suppress uh, the possibility of a, a buildup of moisture, showers, thunderstorms, etc., etc. But we're keeping our eyes on the development of some sort of a feature um, as we progress through to late this upcoming week here. And this may, uh, at, at the very least, is going to ease uh, the development drought over southern and central Florida here at least. We continue to play it through. You notice here that we continue to see a lot more moisture starting to become a lot more stretched out as the MGO enters this region, and uh, you, you start to see an improvement. Look at the moisture now starting to spread in the southern and central Mexico as well. So this will be much welcome news. But notice the area of precipitation becoming more expansive as we go through the course of the next week to ten days in terms of. Um, the ECMWF, so that was the GFS. Let's look at the ECMWF and see what it is showing with regards to the overall solution. Get back to the here and now, and you can see that as we play through this loop here, you can see the buildup of moisture because starting to become a little bit more expansive across this region, as I've already explained. Notice here that the ECMWF is not necessarily showing the development of low pressure, but what it is doing is, as those troughs are um, entering the southeastern United States, it's allowing the moisture to kind of get pulled northwards out of the Caribbean into the eastern portions of the Gulf of Mexico, bringing the rains to Florida and the Gulf Coast region as well here. But it doesn't necessarily indicate any kind of development, but nonetheless, this is welcome news for many people that are struggling with drought. Go back to the GFS model here, and I'll show you the total accumulated precipitation. That's quite an interesting one to look at here. So let's have a look and see what it's indicating. So this is the total accumulated precipitation between now and the 18th of June. And you notice here that still not a huge amount of moisture over central and northern Mexico, if you notice, but look at the amount of moisture here through the Central America region. Even the Yucatan's getting in and Western portions of Cuba is getting um, hammered. And also southern and central Florida here is going to see a significant amount of rain. Upwards of, a, of what, 10 to 24 inches of rain may fall in parts of Western Cuba, South Florida, parts of Central America between now and the 18th of June, which is obviously quite a long way off. So, uh, yeah, moisture is starting to expand and increase in this region through the next uh, week to 10 days, courtesy of the MGO progressing through the Americas and the Atlantic Basin. Uh, but you notice here that if we look at the, um, the um, upper level wind shear potential, this is still quite a hostile environment. And you notice here that it doesn't look as if um, over the next wee while we've got still strong winds here. The, the darker kind of ready colours represent stronger winds. This is between 200 and 850 millibars, by the way, or 18,000 feet uh, down towards 5,000 feet. Stronger the wind shear, the more chance it's going to suppress any sort of development here. But uh, as we play through the loop, you notice here that we, we continue to see a strong wind shear over the northern Gulf and uh, through Cuba. We do have an area of more relaxed con um, winds within the vertical column uh, through Central America into parts of Central Mexico as well. Further north, we've got a lot of shear. We've got these troughs that drop south. That increases winds within the, uh, within the atmosphere over the United States, over the southeastern United States as well. But it's really what you want to see is these winds uh, becoming a little bit more relaxed, perhaps getting lifted a little bit further north. That would allow a more conducive environment further north. But it's uh, the reason for a lack of a uh, of 
likely development is the fact that we've got quite a lot of shear. Notice here by the time we get to Friday the 14th of June, we've actually got a little bit less in the way of uh, winds through the Gulf of Mexico. So we do need to keep an eye on this. There's no imminent threat of a development. If you notice here, the National Hurricane Center does not have a threat of tropical cyclone activity within the next 48 hours. That may change as we progress through the upcoming week if conditions become more favorable. But all, all in all, we don't have any sign of development at the moment, but we do have welcome news in terms of rainfall uh, progressing a little bit further north over the Western Atlantic region here. So we'll continue to monitor the situation. Be sure to hit that like button, share with your friends and family. Let me know in the comments if you're enjoying these tropical updates and that will continue to drive me uh, to, to produce more Saturday tropical content. Remember, live stream 4 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. I hope you can join me. And a massive thank you to everybody's support in recent times as well. Bye for now.